to this meeting of the Economic Development Standing Committee. Um, we have no public forum today, so we'll move on to apologies. Um, I have one apology from Councillor Vanderbus. Um, I'll move that that apology be sustained. Thank you, John. All in favour? Barry. That takes us to declarations or oh, confirming the agenda. Um, I'll move that the agenda be confirmed. Councillor Calvert seconds. All in favour? Aye. Carried. Uh, declarations of interest. Just a reminder that if you have uh, any interest that would form a conflict, you should withdraw. On to the first report. Um, and I think we're being joined by Bree. The business events update. Welcome, Bree. The floor's yours. I think, do you have a little video for us to watch? So this video is called Hosted at Home and it just gives a little bit of background about the conference assistance program and the work that we do with Tourism New Zealand when bidding for international conferences. So this was 
actually a video that we played at a recent event we held in conjunction with Tourism New Zealand at the University of Otago. And that was to highlight the resource of the Conference Assistance Program and, and the sorts of support and funding available for academics that would like to bid for international conferences. Uh, this event was endorsed by the Vice-Chancellor and it was attended by about 50 of the academic community. Uh, Professor Lloyd Davis also spoke to the group about the experience he'd had with this program and also working with Tourism New Zealand and Enterprise Needham um, on the successful bidding for the Public Science Communication Conference, uh, which will be coming in 2018. <coughs> so from this event we generated about seven leads, uh, four of which have actually progressed into formal bids, um, two of them you'll see from the material that I've passed out. Uh, the four bids, they, the size conferences range from 300 to 1,000 delegates uh, and they would be for the duration of 2018 to 2020 and of those four conferences they would all likely fall between June and August. Um, if successful, those four, will, those four bids would contribute um, around $4 million to the local economy. So the pressure points within the tourism uh, industry at the moment and also continued coverage around the additional, four proposed additional convention centres in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and potentially Queenstown. It, it's been a trigger for us to look at uh, new areas for growth so that we can re remain sustainable and also continue to grow our market share. Uh, we see that uh, international conferences on, offer the strongest potential for growth. Uh, Enterprise and Eden, supported by the Road and Eden Partnership, have actually engaged a, um, a full-time employee for a fixed period of three months with the hope to extend this by another 12 months. And that, that position is to drive an international business events plan and look to attract the international conferences, predominantly because they attract, attract the high visitor and also they help us to reduce, reduce the seasonality. Um, as you can see from what I've just said, that so far in a really short period of time we've actually we've had some really strong results, so we hope that we can continue on with this position. Uh, Overall, Dunedin continues to hold market share at 3.4% of, of the national share. The city has experienced, so even though we're only holding, we've still experienced growth in line with the national trends. So we've had an 11% increase in the number of business events, which equates to an additional 195 events. Uh, we've also experienced strong growth in the multi-day conferences and conventions and the duration. So a 34% increase in the number of two-day conferences to 47 and a 21% increase in the, in the number of conferences over two days um, to 58. Um, as I've already mentioned, they do attract higher visitors and um, they, you know, they predominantly conference outside of um, peak seasons. So the international delegates spend an average of 5.8 nights in New Zealand, four of which are in the host region and they spend um, a, an estimated $350 per day. Um, domestic conference delegates spend uh, 2.9 nights in the host region and they are spending an estimated amount of $509 per day. So as you will see this report just highlights some of the, um, some of the results that we've had and what we've been working on. Any questions? Yes. Questions, Councillor Tapper. Terry, and thank you very much um, for your report. I have a couple of questions, and um, they're similar to questions which I think I asked last time. The report, a report on this came through, um, and they relate to carbon offsetting and voluntourism. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering, um, I, do you guys have any stats on when, when? Um, the, the, num the, the 195 or whatever it is, events that come here, what proportion of those are aiming to carbon offset their event? No, unfortunately we don't um, collect that sort of information. Uh, that, that would be probably up to the individual venues um, to be collecting. Uh, however, I know that 
uh, more and more is being done in the industry. I mean, our national carrier, uh, you know, do do what they can to to offset a number of the professional conference organisers within our industry are moving to be carbon zero certified. So there are certainly ways in which we can. Um, try and minimise it, and I mean, there's always going to be more ways we can do that. So, yeah. So, I guess what, just um, looking through the two documents, which ended up on the side of the table, I'm not sure where the other ones are. Um, it doesn't appear that you guys are including any information about carbon off local carbon offset options or volunteer volunteerism options in that pack. Is um, that? We probably wouldn't do it at this stage of the process, but certainly when it comes to um, once we've won the process and working with them on, because it, it, I guess at the initial stage, if you take it right back, we're promoting New Zealand first and foremost um, to, to win the conference, and once we've won the conference, then we can start getting into those more in-depth conversations. And they certainly are being held. We're, we're seeing a number of conferences doing that volunteerism, so uh, groups going out to Orokanui, for example, and doing some, some volunteer work there as, as part of their conference program. Um, also, I have been working with um, a, a professional conference organiser based in Queenstown that are looking at, to develop that as, mm. as a part of their model as well. So, I, I'll ask one further question before I get into debate, um, and that is, um, I guess I'm just I'm curious about whether or not, given that we have in those packs information about the visitor, many different visitor opportunities, mm -hmm. including broader touring opportunities, um, the accommodation options available, mm -hmm. um, noting that a lot of the conferences that we have are knowledge-based, reasonably high-end mm -hmm. um, conferences, which may well be interested in volunteerism or carbon offsetting. Yeah. Um, you're not seeing demand for that information coming through um, in, in, in upfront information like this? No, not, not as yet. Not in that early, early discussion, but it, there's not to say that we couldn't look to add something in it. I guess we do hang our hat off the 100% pure New Zealand, which, which has its own connotations. So, but yeah, I mean, we can certainly look to you know, start including something in those. Thank you very much. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thanks, Bree. My questions are similar, but perhaps at a higher level. Um, we had the director of the Edinburgh Festivals out here last year, and she talked about how um, international partners were reluctant to work with them unless they could pr pr provide um, adequate environmental credentials to those international partners. So even at a base level of um, marketing and branding, has it not been considered to integrate our community's uh, environmental aspirations as part of our selling point on the international market? Yeah, again, um, I, uh, we personally haven't come across that demand yet, but that's not to say that you know we shouldn't be looking at, at ways we can do it. I guess we just have to... Um, we have to be careful at how much information we include because it, it, at this point they're often looking for quite specific sets of information and you, you don't want to lose them by including too much, but certainly certainly happy to be uh, you know, putting, a, putting a note. I guess my question is less about has there been demand as it is about are we looking proactively at presenting it because people may not ask for it and they don't know what they don't know. Um, and so we have the opportunity to present whatever information we like when it comes to pitching for these things. So how can we broaden the scope of count, acknowledging that there's limited space in, your, in, a, in a printed publication, how, how can we um, better integrate our council and our community's wider strategic objectives within the business event space, whether that's environmental or waste minimisation or arts and culture or mm -hmm. Whatever. So I'm just wondering whether those are ongoing conversations and um, how we can um, how we can help progress them. Yep, uh, absolutely. It's, it's, I'm certainly prepared. To, or I, I know that as an organisation, we're certainly prepared to to have those conversations and look for the most appropriate way to do it. Um, I mean, that's. Great. I, I haven't personally looked into it as yet, but I think that it's definitely a conversation worth starting. Great. Thank you. Councillor Benson-Pope. 
Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I just, um, in looking at the very um, impressive high quality of that visual branding that um, I think we, you deserve to be congratulated, but I wanted to ask um, that image, that visual image of the city that we're seeing across lot, all, all the publications, and especially those ones we've just looked at, uh, is that um, secure in, in that you've got a group of people doing it or one agency doing it rather than one individual who's got these high level skills? Because the presentation I think is stunning and I'd like to be assured that um, should one or two individuals change, um, you're not going to lose the consistent message that's being presented. Um, absolutely. So uh, you'll see there's a couple of examples. So we've got our local example. Uh, we've got two local examples and two international examples. So locally we work um, within, our, within our branding guidelines and it's something that the Dunedin City Council Marketing and Communications team can produce as, as well as a local designer that we use. Um, also uh, for Tourism New Zealand um, we work with Reserve Group which is Tourism New Zealand's preferred group and you know we, we own a lot of those images and, and that content. So. Okay. It, we shouldn't have any issue with that. Good, thank you. Councillor Calvert. Could you tell us a wee bit about, I know who produced that video <coughs> clip, but why it was produced and for what audience? So, uh, obviously the people that we target when we're trying to pitch for international conferences is is thought leaders and leaders in their field. So whether that's the business community or within the tertiary academic community. So what we wanted to do, or what Tourism New Zealand wanted to do, was to to show people that have, have used the conference assistance program to show how easy it is and how it can help uh, the individuals, the you know, the tertiary organisation, for example, you know, Otago University, to grow their profile, and also um, have have people speaking to them in in the sorts of ways. That, yeah, they're being spoken to by their peers rather than having a marketing agency say to them, right, you sh you need to bid for this conference and and for this reason. So I think it's it's certainly to give it a bit more credibility and. So it's aimed at so it's aimed at people who might be bidding for conferences with a view to providing endorsements. Sorry, can you please rephrase that? It's aimed to people asking for bidding for conferences, mm. like the people in the yep. video have done, and intend to provide endorsements by people who have already done so? Um, we cer there's certainly no there's certainly no expectation of endorsement. I mean, Tourism New Zealand produce over, I think, around 60 bids a year, and you know that's three individuals they've used over the last three years that have helped help them to endorse it, and they're generally happy to endorse it if they if they've had success and they've they've had that support that they often haven't been able to find within their own organisations. So I wasn't I wasn't meaning to criticise that you would do such a thing. I'm just wanting to trying to establish in my own head what the purpose of it and who it was for and so it is intended for those people. It's all right. I wasn't as I say criticising that you would use the endorsement procedure to do that. Just was that what you so just to clarify a point there, I think the video aimed was aimed at the academics and others that would be best able to t take a bid to a conference, so it was to encourage them to enter into that process of discussing um, if they had that opportunity, uh, all of the support that would be available to them so that they didn't feel that they was a, there was a burden if they stuck their hand up to, to want to host an international conference. Um, the more of them we get doing that, uh, the more work it generates for us and, and ultimately, hopefully, the end result is we get conferences here. Councillor Bazette. I agree. Um, with, we're working in partnership, or you know, Dunedin Enterprise, uh, Enterprise of Dunedin, working in partnership with Tourism in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. To what degree do they control where the <coughs> conferences, or do they control where conferences are held? I, I read somewhere here, I just can't pick it up, but I think we've got something like 4 or 5% of the international market. Um, 
uh, Tourism New Zealand, uh, uh, they're able to say, well, this one will go to, uh, a conference will go to Rotorua, this one here will go to Christchurch, it's to Auckland. And if that's the case, how can we influence that? I mean, if, if we believe that we've got something to sell that is, that is better, if that's the right word, um, than elsewhere, are we able to um, do something about that in, in an aggressive way? Yep. Um, Tourism New Zealand don't have any control whatsoever over the destination chosen, so it's about finding the people, the champions that are prepared to put up their hand. So quite often you'll have someone that they might meet in Wellington say, I would like to bid for this conference, but I'd like to bid for it on behalf of the University of Otago. So it, it's about where the thought leaders are, and, and generally they will, they will bid f on behalf of their university or their institution. Um, or their home city, you know, depending on what their preference is. But t Tourism New Zealand don't have the influence on that. They're completely guided by where that person would like to bid for. Unless on, on the instance that perhaps um, a city isn't able to accommodate the numbers or, you know, the, you know what, what would they, they would need for the conference. But generally, it's completely guided by the academic or the individual. And, and what, what sort of autonomy have we got, if at all, in that if, for example, we wanted to bid for a conference anywhere mm -hmm. um, and um, Tourism New Zealand were not interested, uh, we could still do that or, or we are an absolute partnership with them? No, absolutely not. So the, the conference assistance program, as a guideline, it's generally for conferences over... Um, 200 people and they have to have a certain proportion of international delegates. However, if someone came to us from, let's say, from the university or the polytech for a conference for 100 people that was international, even if Tourism New Zealand wouldn't help in some way, we would certainly provide on the ground support. Um, we don't have um, the level of resource to be able to, to offer the sorts of funding they can get from Tourism New Zealand, but we certainly help them as we would a domestic conference coming to the city. Councillor Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's a question around uh, the, the looming um, competition uh, for, for hosting conferences from f uh, four new, pr or proposed anyway, um, conference centres. Um, I'm just wondering what do you think uh, Dunedin has to offer that they can't offer? I guess there are points of difference is what we're aiming for here, uh, is it? Or are we looking at a whole range of things? Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think it, it, it depends on which market you're looking at, but I think we are very lucky to have the, the, the tertiary institutions that we have here, and, and that is our point of difference. We, we can be targeting conferences in specialty areas that, that would be almost irrelevant to some of the other cities. Um, we're also um, fortunate enough to, to have now Gig City behind us as a brand, so when you are trying to attract international conferences as well to be able to say that you have that functionality to be able to take the conference to the world while they're here. So, uh, you know, UNESCO City of Literature, that, that, that was a huge part in us being able to bid for the Women in Travel Summit that uh, unfortunately we were unsuccessful on. However, um, that designation actually gave us the opportunity when the opportunity wasn't there for us initially. So, uh, you know, we have got a lot of points of difference outside of you know our wonderful tourism activities. I think it's you know it's more about that high level um, stuff that the city can offer. Councillor Vincent Pope. Thank you. In the papers you mentioned the collaboration with the university in, in respect of the bidding, and you've talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, do we as a city and the tertiary institutions also have the administrative organisational capacity when they win those bids to actually organise things or enough support to make sure those conferences when they get them are successful? Yep, that's actually a really good question and that, that's the, the great thing about this conference assistance program is that the first step in the process is to do a financial feasibility study. So at that point we would encourage that the the academic or the person bidding for that conference include a professional conference organiser in, in that initial study so that they, then they can make that decision whether they can afford to do it with having full support uh -huh. or whether they need to trim that back because I think in the past, uh, 
you know, someone might have won a conference and then come to us saying they need help and they realise they're in a position where they perhaps don't have the resource themselves. So, that, so the idea of this, this program is to actually give them the resource right back at the beginning. Thank you. And, and the other question is for Ms Christie, I suspect that one of the other parts of this equation is the accommodation side of things. So I'm just looking forward to what he can tell us about progress on uh, further five-star, four-star plus hotels in the city. Uh, look, the accommodation, <coughs> accommodation a couple of peak times in the year is an issue uh, around major events, uh, events bidding that um, Bree is talking about. We specifically go out looking for those um, conferences that are off peak season so that they don't clash with what will already be a full city, uh, both for accommodation and also the other activities that take place uh, around those conferences. So our preference is to try to get, um, you know, get that bidding process into the months when we have a city that's not at capacity. Uh, we're, we're constantly working on the opportunities around further accommodation uh, that would make that also desirable at um, peak times such as February. Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Another question that I have the sense is going to turn into a suggestion. Um, but, I, but looking through the printed collateral, I was surprised given that these are aimed at, some of them are aimed at international markets, at the, the lack of presence of um, mana whenua or in particular kaitahu values. Um, one of the, there are photos in one of them of a marae in Rotorua, for example. Um, we do have some. Um, and I, I just wonder whether that is something that is being actively pursued. As, I mean, it is an international point of difference, our indigenous culture. Mm -hmm. And it would be good to see it celebrated as, if we're trying to showcase ourselves on an international platform. So is that something that um, you have adequate uh, in-house resource to help you with? Uh, or is it something that you would need uh, assistance to help put together? Um, on a local level, um, definitely, uh, you know, any assistance is, is, would be grateful. Um, fr from a national and level, from both Tourism New Zealand and our Conventions and Incentives New Zealand, it's all about Manakatanga and that hospitality that we can extend. And we, you know, our cultural and indigenous, um, is, you know, everything that we celebrate is, is certainly put on the forefront um, in our bids and in our presentations when it comes to conferences. It, yes, admittedly on a local level, you know, I don't have as much access to that, that information as I would like, so I'd certainly be open to some suggestions on that. That's great, thank you. Councillor McTavish, you indicated you were going to move something. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've sent it through to Pam and, and, and to everyone, actually. So it's just the recommendation on the order paper and um, and a request that staff investigate and report back on how the clearly very successful business events um, work that's happening um, might be able to contribute directly to the wider strategic framework. Um, obviously it's already doing that in some ways but I think there are some uh, potential ways to leverage um, what is clearly a growing um, market for um, broader um, objectives that we have. Uh, you know, there will be events that are offsetting their carbon quite regularly, and if we can um, track or uh, you get that resource applied locally um, rather than to a national scheme or whatever, then that will be growing um, the revenue that's coming into this community. Um, volunteerism, same deal, but from a community perspective, a range of community groups out there keen to um, receive as much assistance as possible from volunteers. There may well be ways in which we can um, promote that um, more strongly or promote local groups more strongly in that way. Other speakers? If not, I'll put it. All in favour? Against? Okay. That brings us to... Um, Matters for consideration by the Chair. Hey, Carl. Uh, yeah, um, noting the um, report in the paper on today on the initiatives around cycling, I wonder if staff might report on opportunities afforded to Dunedin 
by recent cycling initiatives and how the city might capitalise on them. So it's pretty broad, but clearly there's a considerable amount of resource coming into the region uh, from outside. Uh, and uh, the network that's been formed, interestingly, uh, doesn't connect at the moment with the one trail that starts in Dunedin, which is the Targa Central Rail Trail. And I, would, I think that there's an opportunity here, or potentially an opportunity, I'd like, to, I'd like some feedback from staff on what those might be. Um, yeah, thank you for that. We certainly have looked at the announcement with some interest in terms of what Dunedin can do to, to get its uh, stake on some of the government funding that may be available. I'm pleased to say that we've already begun engagement with the MBIE um, to see what would be involved in us um, accessing some of that government funding, particularly linking into the trails that have now uh, been granted some of that funding from both the Central Lakes Trust and the Community Trust of Otago alongside government funding. Uh, we would need to put in an application and that would need to be a joint application with, um, with an appropriate body such as the, um, the Trails Trust. Uh, that's something that we would obviously be looking to do as a first step and bring back a recommendation to Council following that. So, Mayor Cull, are you happy that that's the way forwards. We can do it either as by way of a report back to the committee, or if um, time is of more of the essence, to actually just work with the appropriate bodies to to get the outcome we're all looking for. Councillor Wilson, do you have someone that John should make contact with from the Trails Trust in sort of starting this process? <coughs> Um, the, as Chair of Target Central Rail Trail Trusts, as one has to do under number four, um, jo Evan Freshwater from the New Zealand Cycle Trails, Naharanga, would be the best bet, which I will give you his number. Okay, that'd be great. Okay, councillors. Uh, Councillor Tavish. Sorry, just one more thing. Um, and maybe I should have made it a C, but in light of the issues raised by Council Councillor Hawkins around mana whenua, involvement in the, the bid process, I wonder whether putting that on the next Māori Participation Working Party agenda would be a way to um, begin those conversations. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, councillors, that brings us to the end of, the, of this standing committee meeting. Um, we'll take a short break while Councillor Thompson comes to the chair.